grab your party gas, your Bolivar, and my personal favorite, Davidoff, and step in with us to the smoke-filled room. I'm Patrick Fingston. I write the Illinois political newsletter, which you can find at the Illinois, I-L-L-I-N-O-I-Z-E dot com. I'm filling in for our friend Colin today, who we are hope is uh, enjoying time with his wife, Abby, and their beautiful new little boy, Teddy. Congratulations to the Corbett's, and we wish them happiness and at least some sleep. We're recording this on Thursday ahead of Illinois Sweet 16 game tonight against Iowa State, hence the orange tie. Uh, So when you watch this on Friday, you'll know whether I'm a very happy boy or a very grumpy uh, boy. Uh, Joining us today, Chris Jakowiak, of course, political team decked out in White Sox gear to go to opening day with four of his best friends. Uh, and Michael Butler from Course Political Team, but our two special guests, uh, we are pleased to welcome State Representative Amy Ellick from Godfrey. She served on the House since 2021, was recently appointed to House GOP leadership, and is one of the House Republican budget negotiators. Representative, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. And we're joined by Rhonda Belford, the chair of the Hardin County Republican Party and president of the Republican County Chairman's Association, and of course, as I call her, the Queen of Southern Illinois. Uh, Rhonda, welcome. Thank you. Good to All be right, let's you. let's get into our our packed agenda. Uh, I I think in, in this, you know, our our lovely Southern Illinois people may want to. Uh, uh, roll their eyes at the vote counting in Chicago and Cook County. But I know Chris and I have been following this closely. A week later, the Cook County state's attorney's race remains close at 1,600 votes between Eileen O'Neill Burke and Clayton Harris III. There, there seems to be a perception that Republican voters may have helped Burke. Uh, I, I've looked at the numbers. I don't think there's anything conclusive. Uh, Chris, I'll let you start. Did Republicans play any role in this race? Well, with a margin of this close, currently Burke is sitting at a margin of 1,637 votes that are putting her in the lead right now. Anything can be considered putting her over the top right now. Um, be it Republican voters pulling Democratic ballots or, much to my uh, dismay, the abortion-first messaging that Burke's campaign put out there, increasing her margins in progressive wards, are also probably putting her over the top right now. Um, when it comes to Republican voters, I have to say a couple things. The first thing is there was nothing on the Republican ballot to cycle in Cook County. There was two congressional primaries, one in the first with very, very poor candidates in a race no Republican can win, and a very small portion of Lamont Township with the 11th congressional district. So there weren't any major races on the Republican ballot that anybody was going to pull a ballot for to vote in a primary. The other thing is is that conservatives and you know Republican quote unquote voters Pulling Democratic ballots in Cook County isn't anything new. Um, you look at some of the vote totals in places like the 19th Ward, the 41st Ward, um, the 23rd and the 13th Ward, very conservative white working class areas. These places have been pulling Democrat ballots since the, the dawn of the Chicago political machine 100 years ago. So, And these people still are voting for Trump, mainly at the top of the ticket, but other Republican voters as well. So I wouldn't necessarily call these voters Republicans. These are Democratic primary voters who vote Republican in the general election. But when it comes to suburban voters, there was an uptick of suburban Republicans pulling Democratic ballots just because there was nothing else to vote for. And Burke's race was the hot ticket this this election cycle. Um, so I would say, yes, Republicans did have a, you know, a say in tipping the scales in this race. Um, but a lot of things did at the end of the day. But Burke should certainly be thankful that her terrible, terrible awareness campaign did come through in some regard that Republicans were aware enough to not pull an R ballot to vote for nobody and pull a Democratic ballot where, ballot where it actually mattered. Well, certainly the piles of money that she brought in over the last couple of weeks before Election Day had to help, uh, especially in what was a low name ID race. Uh, the The reality, though, is... If you're a Republican voter and, and you know, I'm a, I'm a Cook County resident, I pulled a Republican ballot simply to vote against Donald Trump. So, I mean, it's not like I I I, I had down ballot races on on my brain, uh, even as a you know relatively well informed voter. But uh, but I, I think that leads into the 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 situation here is that Burke never should be in this in this predicament. She she had zero presence in the suburbs. None. I, I live in a relatively, you know, upper middle class suburb where I clearly don't fit in as a farm boy. 
Uh, and But there were no Burke signs, no Burke presence, nobody knocked on our door. And and it, it's it's story after story like that where she just did not lock this down in the suburbs when she could have and it and, and Michael maybe you maybe you want to weigh in here on strategy because it just seems like there was no ground game for her in the suburbs. Yeah, she should have. I mean, she should have had you know people knocking doors in those suburban neighborhoods where she could have run up the numbers a little bit. Um, and then she wouldn't be, we wouldn't be in this position now. We're just waiting and waiting to see, you know, who wins. And it's going to be by a handful of votes, it seems like. Yeah. And look, the suburban Cook County released a precinct results today, which I'm very thankful for. Usually it takes them a little bit longer to get them out there. Um, and you're seeing that Burke is doing worse in some suburbs than Bill Conway did against Fox back in 2020. Um, the most egregious example is Cicero. Cicero is a majority, it is the most Mexican suburb in the country, and, or at least one of them. And Bill Conway won it in 2020, 2020's election, and Harris is winning it pretty significantly this time around. Burke's only winning a few precincts. So a little bit of Hispanic outreach would have helped in a place like Cicero. The other thing that's sticking out to me is, now I, I need to look into these numbers a little bit more, Frank, but I'm seeing that there are a few precincts in Orland Township, which is a very white, moderate suburb, uh, suburban township that went to Harris. And that doesn't make any sense to me. So you're looking at, Burke ran a Chicago first campaign. Her focus was, I'm going to do well in Chicago because Chicago, if I just get a big enough percentage of vote in Chicago, I can win this race. But had she ran an actual awareness campaign to the suburbs of, this is an important race, you need to vote and you need to vote for me because Clayton Harris is the next Kim Fox she would have been up 10,000 votes right now as opposed to being up 10,000 on election night and now trickling as votes trickle in her margin gets smaller and smaller. She should have ran away with this given her, her city margins, but the suburban margins just aren't there, and that's the reason why it's close. Interestingly, though, the as the vote count has come in over the last week, and, and we're to the point now where it's it's not provisionals or, or, or election day vote, it's all kind of the the trickle in of mail in vote at this point the the tinfoil hat brigade has come out uh where where they're questioning the legitimacy of the election and uh i i I've, I've been posting results on twitter you know pretty much every night as as we've gotten updated counts and and the stolen election and democrats are going to it's it's not 1960 mayor daly filling out kennedy ballots so there there's while there's been some communication incompetence, especially in the city of Chicago, it's it's not like an election is being stolen here. And and I'm 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 maybe this is where I bring in my my more Republican activist friends here into the conversation is I I don't know if this is a Trump thing or if this is just a stereotype thing of Chicago where where so many Republicans now believe that there's no such thing as a legitimate election. But but can you can you ladies who who are far more in tune with the Republican base than I am these days, can can you explain as to where this comes from? Is this a Trump thing or is this just the the old mayor daily thing holding on? Well, do you think that people are starting to have an awakening that they are starting to get in tune with what's going on just with just like what's happening with the opening of uh, a Republican headquarters on the South side. Uh, people are starting to wake up. They're wanting to see a change in, in Chicago land. So, uh, and I do think it does have to do with the Trump movement. People are tired of what's going on. They're starting to stand up. They're starting to change. And we're starting to see that in, in Chicago land. So I do think it has to do with that. I'll remember that when Trump gets 15 percent in the city. And well, well, I mean, really, because honestly, even with Trump and his delegates, there was a clean sweep throughout the whole state, honestly. I, you know, I would say, too, that people that awakening isn't just to politics. It's also to the inefficiency and incompetence of government. And when you see something that people rely on government to do, which is run elections, and then there's questions, um, it gets people angry. It, it gets opinions out and about. And, and of course, people are going to question 
what is really going on? Are they really that incompetent that they can't get this done quicker? And so I, I think it's just part of people paying attention, you know, more information available than ever on cable news or Twitter or wherever. And, and people are like, how could this possibly be so inefficient when politicians are telling me they've got everything under control all these years and, and they see this incompetence and they're, they're right to question. And the nothing meal, but... seems to be under control. Sorry about that. Nothing seems to be under control. And people are having to stand up and take it into their own hands. But mail ballots coming in for two weeks is nothing new. I mean, this this dates back to military ballots decades ago that, that they've always given two weeks to come in. So it's never it's not like this is some new phenomenon. It's just more people are voting by mail. I think I think the issue here is is like what Amy said, it's incompetence. I mean, you had multiple, multiple communication errors on the behalf of the Chicago Board of Elections, where it's we have this many ballots. Oh, no, we forgot to carry the one. We actually have this yeah. many ballots. Oh, by the way, we actually have less ballots than we said we had previously. It's this incompetence across the board, which is leading to these stories of, you know, people thinking, you know, Preckwinkle controls the county Democratic Party. She probably controls a lot of the jobs that are at the city board of elections at the, at the county clerk's office. You know, it leads people to ask these questions. Now, I'm not necessarily agreeing with those people, but when you think about it like that, it does lead people to believe that something funny may be going on if we can't even get right how many ballots we're going to be counting in the next couple of days because mm -hmm. again like i said it's been it hasn't been one occasion there was one occasion of only a couple hundred votes that they forgot they had fine but it's thousands of ballots in this close of a race people are going to start asking questions whether or not they're war whether they're warranted or not so i think mm -hmm. there are people who need to be fired at the chicago board of elections because of these errors and i think it, for the benefit of making people believe in the validity of future elections. Also, there's a difference in telling us how many ballots are outstanding than any question about the count itself, which which both campaigns have stipulated. There have been no questions about the counting because they're observing everything. They've seen every ballot go through. And 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 there's, there's no reason to believe that there's anything wrong with the count, is yeah. there? I, I wouldn't say there's an issue to be wrong with the actual counting of the ballots. I mean, I know people who are at the city board of elections, 69 West Washington, every day watching the count. It isn't necessarily something wrong with the count, but it is the communication. Because if you're Team Burke, if I was the field director of Team Burke, the guy in charge of doing math every day to see what our margin's supposed to be after these ballots come in, and the city board of elections tells me after I just do my math and say, okay, things are looking good, you know, you know, we, we're looking at this many ballots. We're going into trickle now. Oh, by the way, we forgot about 2,000 election uh, ballots from election day. We didn't process yet. That's That frustrate, That would frustrate me, and you can tell why it's frustrating other people. Wasn't there, a, wasn't there a really unusually high number that somebody quoted of ballots still outstanding? Oh, like, there are tens of thousands of ballots like out. 13,000? So, so I'm, I'm that questioning matter? that. Why did tens yeah. of thousands of people request a ballot and not send it back in. So well, that's the automated. That's, that's the automated they're on vote the by mail for life. List. Exactly, and, and that's now. my point. Yeah. Is what we're sending out tens of thousands of ballots that someone didn't feel that they wanted to to return. That to me, uh, why well, it, are we sending and you know sending postage out on on ballots that are and I tens of thousands, even in the of millions of people, tens of thousands of ballots outstanding that no one's returning is a is a large number well that and this is the first time our... vote by mail permanent vote by mail is being processed and brought back into the to the mix so we are mm -hmm. dealing with that this time for permanent vote by mail so mm -hmm. but, we've but got that to deal with this kind of goes into one of our next topics here and that's you know the you know voter enthusiasm even if people are on the permanent vote by mail database it wasn't like you know well part of this is this campaign quality. I don't, it doesn't, I don't know what Burke's campaign did in this front, but in theory, they could have done a little bit better of ballot chasing, make sure every, you know, moderate white voter from the suburbs returned their vote by mail ballot or as many as possible. Well, they and, also we know, have... and, and we know the Preckwinkle organization is really damn good at that in, in terms exactly. of, the, you know, they, they push to get every mail in ballot into the, into the blue boxes by midnight on election day. I mean, they're, they're pushing hard to get them in. Exactly. So, I think part of the part of the reason why there's not many ballots trickling is I think Burke could have had a better vote by mail program. She might have, she might have. I, I don't know the specifics of that race, but from what I'm seeing with these numbers, 
didn't see, it seems like there's a lot of outstanding vote by mail ballots that could have been brought in that weren't. Um, and in addition, it's this voter enthusiasm. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of, I guarantee, I mean, I would, I would need to see a breakdown of these numbers, but a lot of those, this isn't broken down for partisanship. When they tell you there's 50,000 outstanding ballots out there, there's probably a bunch of, you know, Republicans who are on the permanent vote by mail uh, registry who just got the ballot, looked at and said, well, why the hell am I even going to bother sending this in? Because right. my choices are vote for Trump and then the rest of the ballots, like there's nothing there. So that's mm-hmm. part of it. That's part of this issue. There was no, a lot of people just didn't have a reason to turn in the ballot. this time. And before we move on, Chris, um, I, I feel like Burke wins this race. Um, maybe maybe the Harris folks go to a discovery recount, which very rarely leads to a full recount. I, I get the sense as we're getting down to a trickle of ballots now that, that it's going to be a lot harder for Harris to pick this up. What do you think? So I posted on Twitter the other day that I am refusing to call this race until Harris either concedes or April 2nd comes around. Because well, you can't call the race with that many outstanding ballots. It's just impossible to. Right. So I'm, I'm not... I, but. My opinion right now with what's in front of me is that Burke is fine. I think Burke will pull through this, and even with a discovery re- uh, discovery recount, I think she'll be fine. Will Harris right. go to a recount? I don't know. Um, Somebody posted on Twitter this morning that J.B. Pritzker just sent uh, the Cook County Democratic Party $250,000. Um, is he paying for the recount? I wouldn't. I mean, I don't know why he would, but it's well, certainly but, a little bit interesting. But that's but. the process. That's the process that people don't always remember for a recount is is a, a, a losing candidate within a couple of percent goes to the county clerk and, and the board of elections and asks for a discovery recount of a portion of those uh, those precincts. If there's any evidence that comes out of that discovery recount, which, again, because these machines tabulate so well and and so accurately, there's almost never a legitimate change, then you go to a judge and ask for a full recount. The judge is the one that orders a recount. It's not an automatic uh, situation in the state. So, So getting to a full recount takes a lot of steps that we've got a long way to get to. All right, right. So, pay, they have to pay for it too. It's like $16 a precinct that they have to pay, or if, if not more than what I was looking at. I, I, so, I, I don't know that they have to pay for the discovery, but they definitely have to pay for the full recount. So either way, it's, it's, um, it is, it is a certain level of cost. So, all right. So I wanted to move on 24, 2024 as the, the fewest contested primaries uh, in, in over 20 years, some of the lowest turnout that we've seen. What what do you think that means for November? I mean, it's a state Donald Trump's going to, you know, Joe Biden's going to win Illinois by over a million votes again. Uh, you know, we don't have a, another statewide race on the, the top of the ballot. What do you think that turnout means for November? Rhonda, Amy, I want to start with you. Well, I think that by virtue of the fact that Trump was already the the nominee before Illinois got around to its primary date last week. Um, It just, people were like, well, it's over. And so many people probably think like there literally was going to be nothing on the ballot. Yes, you could have still voted for the other candidates. And um, I think just primaries in general, though, or I find myself doing a lot of education to voters, just remi- reminding them that it, that they exist, first of all, but reminding them that those down ballot races, and we did have some some pretty hot races in Madison County contested in, in the Republican primary. So I think it's just always, obviously, it's always going to be tough to get people out to a primary, even when there are con- hot contested races. And, and we have to really educate voters on that and make sure they're enthused in March, just as they will be in November. Uh, I I found it strange that there were people, when I would talk to them, they said, oh yeah, I'm gonna vote, I'm gonna vote in the primary. I said, it was last Tuesday. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So there were people who actually forgot to vote because it had come and gone. And I was very surprised. So there were people that it, it slipped by on this time. So I'm concerned about, the general. So there was this apathy, I think, because they really felt like, you know, it, it hadn't happened yet. So some who really felt it was already over. So unless there was a real challenge, and just like you said, Patrick, there was not much that was contested unless there were certain counties that did have, and there were some, uh, you know, we had some further south that were some hotly contested states attorneys races or 
uh, you know, uh, some congressional races or yeah, things not to mention Boss head. Bailey. Yeah, unless <laughs> there was a real uh, because our presidential race was really over. And just like you say, it's probably going to be the same way in the fall. We don't have anything else uh, to really talk about in the fall. So unless we have, uh, you know, something else uh, and, of course, further south, we're, we're still really red. So we're going to really be uh, to Patrick Chagrin frumping it up. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's how it's going to be. So <laughs> tell every suburban legislative candidate that you're going to do that and they'll cringe. <laughs> I, well, you know, that's just it, it, it. it's not, you know, everybody in, what south of I-80 is extremely happy. So that's that's just how it is. So, <laughs> Michael, what did you make of the low turnout? I think that the numbers, you know, kind of from across the state um, and the primary, there were certain counties that had, you know, heavily contested races and turnout was high, like, you know, Madison County, Saline County, um, Franklin. There were some others where people really showed up to vote, you know, hot, more so than, you know, what they had in previous primaries. Obviously, primary turnout is always going to be kind of like low. You're not going to get a high number of people voting in those. <clears throat> But I would anticipate in the general election, it's going to be probably similar to where, you know, there's going to be some contested state rep races, state Senate races, maybe some countywide races that get really hot and you're going to see higher turnout in those counties. But like you alluded to, Patrick, there's nothing statewide on the ballot really of importance um, unless the Democrats put some kind of constitutional amendment on there, which they may do that. Um, but I would say you're probably going to see pockets of high turnout, pockets of low turnout, and it's just the way it's going to go. I, I think we're looking as we move toward November, two parties that are incredibly divided. Uh, Republicans, I think clearly the the Trump faction has taken over, uh, but there are still the the conservatives who may not be Republicans anymore. Um, you know <laughs> that that are. Uh, are are upset with with the direction of the Republican Party, the the grift that's gone on, and, and then you look at the the fissions inside the Democratic Party, where where you have the governing Democrats who are just kind of being uh, overrun by the the Democratic Socialist let's mm -hmm. let's chant about Gaza whenever we can sort of crowd uh, that wants to be everybody everything to everybody with every tax dollar they can find. And, and, and you find a lot of, you know, you find a lot of division inside each party. Yes. But then you've got to go to everybody in November and say, hey, pick us. So, and again, maybe maybe we start with Rhonda here because you're sunshine and roses on all these things. <laughs> um, what, how do Republicans unite in November considering all of the huge challenges that that party faces? Well, that is the big question, and that's what we've been asking, because there's been a very divisive primary, especially in the 12th with that congressional race. There, It's been hard for the chairman. They've been, you know, on the front lines and the precinct committeemen, really all the way up and down on different issues and been pretty beat and battered. So coming into uh, county conventions and then in May, a state convention, we've got to try to unify and i haven't seen anything really quite like it and i've been involved for many years we've been able to really kind of get in the same room and maybe have differences of opinion but really have a come to jesus so to speak and come out on the other side and and unify but uh we've got two groups within our own party and, and sometimes three you know, that believe differently and they, they each and everyone don't feel like they want to do that. So uh, it still is a really big question uh, for us to do. So, but we've got to have a way to do that because it's about, uh, it's a game of addition, not subtraction. And Representative, uh, so, you look, you look at this through legislative lens too, where you guys have seven seats that you all hold or are trying to hold that were won by Joe Biden four years ago um, and, and a fundraising disadvantage, et cetera. So you guys need everybody to get, get on board, right? It, it's got to happen. It has got Absolutely. to happen. And so uh, some things that, uh, you know, I, we hold on to uh, some of them want to think we're not as Christian as each other. And of course it says, you know, 
love thy neighbor as thyself. And when you got them out there trying to chop the legs out from under each other and then quote scripture behind that, how, how can that be? You know, when it's very obvious that we're, we're definitely uh, not always on the same page, but I believe it can happen because I'm like you, I'm the glass half full kind of person uh, as opposed to the glass half empty. So I, I am an optimist and I believe it can happen. I believe it will happen. Representative from the what's possible, uh, the good Lord will help us and and do what's seemingly impossible. So I am very positive and optimistic about it. Amy from the legislative side. Well, I would say I'm also very optimistic and positive, and I do think that um, a Republican voter in November is still going to vote Republican, even if they don't like every single Republican on the ballot because of these issues that we've had with inner party, you know, squabbles and and arguments. Um, but it certainly is causing, it causes a lot of distress when we're not together on these issues because we could do so much more if we're united. So I, you know, I'd be lying if I, if I said it didn't bother me and I, I didn't worry about it. Obviously we do. We want to make sure that people are on board because it costs us precious dollars to fight against each other. And, um, but I am, you know, hopeful that in November, you know, I, I, I guess I, I'm optimistic that we will definitely still come come home and, and vote Republican up and down the ballot. But we tend to argue about, we, you know, we as we've all said, we agree on 99% of the things. It's just how we get there and maybe the strategy and things like that. And, and that stuff is less important than just getting there. So yes. we're, we're just trying to unite, like Rhonda, so I'm, I'm positive too and, and very optimistic, but I just think... Um, we can't always be, we as a party have to come back together and realize getting it done is more important than, you know, picking apart maybe each candidate's mm -hmm. vision of how to get there. But, but Chris, from a suburban perspective, it's not quite that easy. Uh, you know, I, I think it's pretty obvious that the, the Trump brand is toxic in the, in the city and suburbs and, and and you've got a bunch of legislative races that that are are probably going to be more Trump referenda than they are on that particular race. So so even if Republicans themselves are united, does does that does that are they are they dead with independent moderate voters anyway? I think the Republicans' best chance going into November is that both sides of the political aisle are just so. Is that Donald Trump goes away and Nikki Haley becomes the nominee? That's never going to happen. That's their best I, chance. Let's live in reality here for a second, Patrick. Okay. 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 But the best case scenario with Trump being the nominee is that both vote the voters of both parties are frustrated. Democratic voters, a lot of them, they don't really like Joe Biden. They voted for him in 2020 because they wanted you know a return to normalcy in America. They got that quote unquote return to normalcy in some regard that they wanted, but in reality. You look at Biden on any on a daily basis, and they're like, "Dang, you know, we gotta go with this guy." Republicans think the same way. They're like, "You know, Trump again, man." I, I, so the hope is, is that there will be more disgruntled Democrats who are going to either not show up to vote or just, you know, maybe vote for RFK or something along those lines that will allow suburban Republicans to have an advantage going into November. I think youth turnout is going to be anemic. I think this, this this Gaza issue is going to affect youth turnout. I don't think youth voters are very enthusiastic about Biden. Maybe some of the abortion messaging the Democrats are going to shove down our throats is going to work to their advantage. But as we saw in 2022, that really didn't boost youth turnout that much. So I think youth turnout, they got to make sure youth turnout's low. And they got to make sure that the, Repub the House Republicans need to make sure that the message is not vote Republican. It's going to be vote for the incumbent for X, Y, Z reasons, because they're, they're playing defense. Like, let's be honest with ourselves. They're playing defense. They're not playing offense. So they have to play defense, vote for our candidate because of X, Y, Z, not because we're Republicans. They have to a little bit run away from that because Trump's on the top of the ticket. All right. I wanted to move on uh, really uh, quickly here. I wrote a column this week, which you can find on the Illinois.com uh, self blatant self-promotion there, uh, essentially saying that maybe the Illinois education association should, um, uh, take a break from playing in Republican primaries. Uh, they they spent uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to take out Blaine Willauer and Adam Niemerg, two Freedom Caucus members, 
uh, of the of the the House uh, Republican Caucus and uh, failed miserably. Uh, Niemerg's over eighty percent. Uh, Willauer finished just under eighty percent. Um, Michael, you were you were right on top of these races most of the most of the spring. Um, I obviously my opinions out there that that the IEA is probably not using the right strategy to play in a Republican primary. What's what's your take? Yeah, I think they just botched this from the very beginning. Um, and I think it would be wise to kind of take a break, maybe reevaluate and figure out a new strategy, because obviously what they did did not work in either circumstance. Um, I think that, you know, there is a path for some involvement for them if they want it, but they're going to have to change the way they do things. And it can't be because both of these candidates that they ran got branded from the beginning as like the IEA candidate. Um, and that was toxic. Which is interesting because Jim Acklin is just as conservative of a guy as as any Republican in the House caucus. I mean, you know, as someone I've known since I worked on his race in 16, I mean, the only thing he would break from House Republicans on was uh, was the the school choice issue essentially because he felt like it wasn't needed downstate. So it, it's interesting that even though they're conservative guys, they were still branded as the 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 you know avatar of the woke teachers unions. So I think I don't think IEA should get out of playing in Republican primaries entirely. What I think the IEA should do is stop trying to take out incumbents downstate with a message that's to the left of the incumbent that was the issue this entire time they might have had a chance in the Ackman race if they would have just boosted his name id um well past neenberg and called it a day maybe they do a little bit better but that's and not knocked on some doors knocked on some doors <laughs> see it field wins elections people why, why don't people start understanding this but i think the iea i i think that there's a benefit for them to play in republican primaries if it's an open seat or if they're back in the incumbent but if you're trying to take out an incumbent downstate, the juice is obviously not worth the squeeze. They're blowing hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to take out conservative state legislatures downstate. Mm -hmm. That does not work. It shouldn't work. It's not going to. So if you're the IEA, you need to either play for incumbents or play in open seats. Stop trying to take out. Yeah, that's all. That's always a tough call to do that. You know, and and the folks that were running were good people. And of course they were playing hard against them at all uh, as, a, as a good county chairman. And of course it just, it, did, it didn't work. It didn't work. Representative, does it cause any acid reflux in the House Republican caucus um, to have, you know, there are already some tensions that have been reported on uh, inside the caucus, but, but you see the IEA come after, um, you know, come after these two very conservative members. They're, uh, th they didn't have neither Willauer or or Niemerg had a lot of support from from leadership in in the uh, in the primary. Is is there any internal Republican oh. strife here? Well, I mean, I think we knew that the seat's going to be Republican held no matter what. So I think when we're looking at adding to our numbers, obviously we know certain areas are going to vote Republican no matter what. So when it comes to adding to the caucus, which of course we're trying to do in November, we, we just have to be realistic about where are the races going to be that we need to focus on um, with, with those guys not being members of the caucus. I mean, obviously they wouldn't have expected support, financial support from the house. Political, Republican. political side. I think you, political you mean, side. right. The, yes. The, Thank you. The, yeah, the difference sorry. is yeah. they don't pay their caucus dues to get Correct. campaign the HRO side. Thank you for that clarification too. Um, so they are, um, they wouldn't have expected nor asked for, for support from the House Republican campaign side. As far as IEA, I think, I don't know, like, how many IEA members there are in those districts and, and what the decision making was with IEA. I guess that's going to be part of the, um, you know, after conversation for them is, did we do what our members wanted us to do and how many of them were in that the, those districts and and did they vote for the incumbents anyway. So I think there's, I'm sure they're doing a lot of soul searching and trying to figure out what went wrong and what they could be doing different. And if there's a spot for them to play later in a primary, I'm, they're going to probably be better decision makers going forward based on what happened here. Do, do Republicans want to work with the IAA? I want to work with 
my teachers in my district. And I have a lot of IEA members. I also have IFT members in my district. So I would like to know that my teachers feel that they can come to me and bring issues to me about our schools because we do hear from school management and leadership too. I wanna hear from teachers and I do hear from teachers. And really in my area too, just because they're IEA does not mean they're a Democrat. I would never assume that someone's a Democrat because they're an IEA member. So, you know, I, I want to know what my teachers are needing. And if that comes to me through IEA and IFT by sharing the opinions of their members, I'm gonna listen to what their members want. Let's uh, let's skip ahead here. Uh, the the issue of IVF continues to uh, divide Republicans. Uh, Congresswoman Mary Miller, uh, who Lord knows I've made my opinions clear about uh, over over the last few years, and and I worked a I worked a primary race against her four years ago. So I think it's pretty clear that I'm on the other side. Uh, but she she signed a letter uh, last week in D.C. Uh, in, in which they called IVF morally dubious. Uh, I, I talked to Bill Howder this week, who's a state representative from Morton. He's a, an emergency room doctor, pro-life guy, essentially completely on the other side, that he, that, that IVF is pro-family, uh, pro-life, uh, and, and that we just need to make sure that we're ethically treating uh, any of the the uh, fertilized eggs that aren't aren't being used or aren't viable in the end, which is a perfectly fair position that maybe more Republicans should be talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I want to start with the two Republican women on the panel for this, because this matters a hell of a lot more to you than it does to the the three Jim Oaks sitting here. So, uh, so, so I, I guess from your perspective, seeing the split, knowing the divide within the party, we saw some polling in, in the boss Bailey race that something like 60% of Republicans had issues with IVF. Um, how do you guys reconcile this? Well, well go ahead, Amy, if you okay. want to. You're fine. I guess when you say that the party is split, it that lends itself for people to think it's kind of split 50-50. That is not what I have seen at all. I've actually, I think Dr. Howder has been a great um, voice for us to, to kind of talk about be, because not only is he a doctor, but he is that pro-life uh, person too. And and I tend to, you know, go to him on on issues like this. And I just don't see like a 50-50 split within our caucus on this. So maybe there are a few members that would agree with Mary Miller. I do not. And I I guess I'm surprised to hear that you said 60% of did you say 60%? Of I, I'd have to go back and look at the poll number from, okay. from the M3 poll that, that they did, but it was, it was not, it, it was a surprisingly high number of Republicans that, that have issues with IVF. That, that surprised well, me because I, I just <clears throat> kind of on the ground, this is not an issue before now, this has never been an issue that I thought was going to be controversial. And I think that a lot of people probably just don't have like a, uh, understanding of the process, what it means, all of that. Like there's an education component, I think, that needs mm -hmm. to be done just across the board um, that people don't understand what's going on. I, um, I think that's right, Michael and Amy as well. But my background, I'm a registered nurse, been one for 40 plus years. My background is healthcare. And so folks who are educated uh, in, in healthcare and have that knowledge would probably never have an issue with that, knowing how hard it is for people uh, to get pregnant, uh, knowing people who have gone through that process and who want a baby so desperately uh, would never have an issue with it. And 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 exactly what the good doctor has has told and being educated, I think if if that uh, percentage is correct on your end, Patrick, I think you would see a shift had they been educated in Yeah, that. just to clarify, I had my 60-40 turned around. Asked about the frozen embryos created through IVF, 40% of likely Republican primary voters uh, believe that frozen embryos outside of the mother's womb should be considered a child. So it, it's 60 supporting, 40, 40 okay. opposing. I started to say I would be very Still surprised. a split, though. That's still, okay. I mean, it's still a high number. Well, and I think it, it does, like Michael said, it has to do probably with education. Uh, of the whole situation so um but i'd be you know very supportive i'm glad that 
hear uh, Amy uh, be supportive in the legislature. Well, and it well, was so. it was a big mistake for Mary Miller to sign on to the, that letter with that language. Like J.B. Pritzker and Democrats are already using that on graphics yeah. and stuff against us. And I think maybe if if she had some uh, discussion with some more educated medical folks, she might change her stance on that. I think I think I think irregardless of the kind of the moral question here, let's get into the political side of things. Republicans need to find a way around this issue because if the Demo if, if the Democrats are allowed to make this entire November election about abortion and IVF, the Republicans are toast. They just are. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that we are seeing from every election, from the state's attorney's race to the election in 2022, is that people, for whatever reason, they love their abortion and they love their IVF, especially suburban votes. So Republicans, mm -hmm. for on the IVF issue, they need to either come out and say, listen, I'm not going to get rid of this, no intention of getting rid of this, mm -hmm. or they need to find a way to pivot completely into the issues that actually benefit us, rather than playing directly into Democrats' hand by playing with some social issue. Okay. I think anyone who has a thoughtful bone in their body knows that there's a difference between IVF and abortion, though. I mean, you know, it's 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 not the same thing. One one is adding to a family, and the other is most certainly not. I, I'm, I'm not I, I'm not disagreeing with that statement. My statement is is that if the Democrats are allowed to run a a, a November election cycle completely based on reproductive rights, which includes things like abortion and IVF services, the Republicans are not going to win on. They need to either neuter the IVF question completely or they need yeah, to, they need to get out there and support it. I mean, that's that's essentially the, the issue here. I mean, I, I didn't know where Bill Howder was on the issue until I brought him on the radio on Monday. I didn't know he was the leading voice in the caucus on this, even though I knew he probably should have been as a medical doctor. Like, why aren't Republicans getting out there and putting their their pro family voices that that look and sound, you know, put put the moms up there. You know, this this is a message problem more than a policy problem. Yes. No, and that's what I'm that, that's that's my point here is that it needs to have an effective messaging strategy or else the Democrats are just going to run wild over the Republicans with it. That's my entire point. Here. And Republicans are always or should always uh no matter from birth or wherever we should we're to choose life. We're to promote life. If you're in healthcare or whatever else, we we're to choose life. All right, moving on. Uh, there there were two resignations this week on the Illinois Prisoner Review Board, which is the uh, appointed uh, group that essentially decides on whether uh, someone can be paroled early from prison or not. Uh, the the two members, uh, Donald Shelton and Leanne Miller. Uh, resigned in the wake of a person who was paroled uh, at Miller's suggestion, uh, who essentially immediately got out of prison, uh, went to kill his ex-girlfriend, and in the process killed his 11, her 11-year-old son. Uh, it's a horrifying, uh, terrible crime, terrible tragedy. Tragedy. Um, uh, this the the Republicans in the Senate, because of course it's the Senate issue to advise and consent on these these nominations. So it's not something that's that's specifically fallen in the House uh, category for for the representative, but but still nonetheless an issue you all have been paying attention to. Um, this is this is a bad look for Democrats who already have to look like. Who, and some may not care that they look like they're soft on crime, but but these are the real impacts of the decisions that are being made, and and it's 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 sad that 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 we're I mean and, I, and listen, prison is a, a rehabilitation situation, and and if someone has shown there are a lot of I've read a lot of these briefings on on parolees who have who have changed their lives. And and are perfectly suitable to get out of prison and 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 make their lives better. This guy shouldn't have been out. What are we doing here? This has been a this prisoner review board stuff has been kind of brewing for a while now, by my understanding. I recall going back to even 2022 during discussions with the Safety Act, buried underneath you know article after article and cap facts was discussion about the prisoner review board that really didn't really seem to get that much play. 
Um, it's unfortunate that it takes somebody being released and killing an 11 year old child um, to get some play in the press with this sort of thing. But this has been an issue for a while. People have been getting out of prison. There's a huge recidivism is issue in the state of Illinois, particularly in the city of Chicago. If there, I mean, yes, it's a tragedy. A child died, understandably so. But this is an issue that Republicans and hard on crime people, candidates in general can take advantage of going into the November election. There are people who are just being rubber stamped to get out of prison. They're recommitting crimes. They're, kill they're killing children. And it's sad, yes, but it's also effective. It's in a much effect more effective way to utilize the crime angle than some of the ways that the Republicans have done previously. This is something in concrete. This is somebody who went to jail and the Prisoner Review Board rubber stamped his release and he's back out doing crimes. It's the same thing with the Safety Act stuff. Anytime somebody gets out on, on no cash bail and they commit a crime, that needs to be front page news. So the, the Republicans and hard on crime candidates everywhere need to find circumstances like these and run with it until something gets done. Well, I think as far back, I don't know how many years ago, uh, when they started in my district, we had the most, we do have, I think still do, the most prisons in the state. But uh, back as far as the, even in the Rauner administration, they started getting rid of work camps. So where they could even start stepping down and getting uh, assistance and moving them into work camps and starting to see how they would do. Uh, and, and they were seeing progress with uh, recidivism rates and those types of things. So moving them down, progressing them to see how they would do, uh, those types of things, those were really working. But then they started doing away with the work camps, things like that. So they're, they're either in and they're out, but you're seeing those increases in these types of crimes and things like that and letting these people just back out on the street. So we have a real issue here. Uh, we had a, prog uh, a process that was working. And now these work camps have been closed. Uh, all of these types of things. And uh, our work camp here in Hardin County was the first thing to go. And that's been however many years ago was that now, Michael? That's been, is that eight uh, years? A long time. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But I feel like if you look, if you think back over the course of Pritzker's time in office, this prisoner review board has been a problem the entire time. I mean, last summer he was under, playing yeah, those games Pritzker. where he would appoint somebody to the board and then you know they would get their 90 days or whatever it was and then on the last day he would you know they would resign and then he would reappoint because he didn't want to have to go through the approval process in the senate so this is right at this goes right at the feet of jb pritzker he's and been playing games right with this pr speech. prison pr this prison review board from the beginning and that's why we have a situation like we do today it's, it's, it's worth yeah. mentioning though it's worth mentioning though both shelton and miller are republicans so, so this is not necessarily a Republican versus Democrat issue. I, I think it might be yeah. more of a, a a guidance or rules on who should and shouldn't be let out. Representative, do you think there's a legislative fix here? I think there probably is if the Democrat majority would let it go through. And we have obviously have problems getting through things like that, which relate to very important public safety issues. But the yes. Democrats perceive these as penalty enhancements or, you know, somehow unfairly discriminating and against people that are in prison. So this is on the Democrat majority and the governor to take the lead on this, fix the problems. And the the issues you mentioned, you know, we need to get that message out there about this. Sadly, there are cases every single day in almost every community in Illinois where someone is let out based on the no cash bail and they're, they're reoffending. There's there are so many cases throughout the state. We could have a very, very long list to, to message. I mean, honestly, our newspapers around here are doing the messaging themselves because at the end of every um, little police blotter clip, it'll say the person was, you know, was released, you know, from pretrial pre detention. And they're putting that out. Many of them are putting that out there. And I encourage them to do that. Funny and you should mention the Democratic majority. <laughs> there might have been a news story late last week uh, about the Speaker of the House, Chris Welch, and his staff, okay. who uh, essentially decided the First Amendment doesn't mean a damn thing. Uh, and they tried to convince their members 
uh, not to talk to Jeremy Gorner, a, uh, a great state house reporter for the Chicago Tribune uh, and a friend of mine. Uh, who was simply asking questions of Democrat members who gave money at the speaker's behest uh, to defeat Representative Mary Flowers in the primary. Uh, it was one of the more boneheaded things that I've seen a legislative leader do. Uh, and it, I, my, my guess is that Welch probably didn't know a thing about it until the newspaper put it out last week. Uh, and and then his spokesperson probably had to answer for it. Listen, here's the thing. I I, I used to be a real reporter. I'm, I'm not a reporter anymore. I, I write columns. I'm, I'm not a straight reporter these days. And, and I admit that. And there are people who criticize me for that. And that's fine. But but I'm credentialed at the state house. I'm credentialed in the House and Senate. Uh, they they may not like me. <laughs> You know, Representative Ellick may roll her eyes when I walk up to her with a recorder outside of the House chamber. Uh, and if she even if she doesn't do it externally, she may do it internally. <laughs> but for the legislature to attempt for legislative staff to attempt to negate the rights of the free press is beyond reproach for me. They should be ashamed of themselves. And. And this, if this is the kind of crap that, that we're going to see pulled in Springfield, I hope that reporters just revolt. Rick Pearson pulled no punches last week on, on, House, on House Democrats. And that stuff's not going to end if they keep this crap up. Um, so I, I just, I want to, I want to open this up, but like reporters are annoying. I'm, I used to be one of them. I was, I, I dealt with, you know, I, I was a PR person on campaigns. Uh, I married a reporter. Let me tell you, they're annoying. Uh, but, but this isn't this. The First Amendment is the most important thing that we have because nothing else matters without freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. How the hell can they do this? Well, you you want to know what I can give you to the why they did this? Uh, because because well, they think they're untouchable. That's why they did this. Well, yes, yes, they think they're untouchable. Just as I was about to give Welch some props after not completely bumbling the primary cycle this time around, after he bumbled it in 2022 in his first year as you know caucus leader and everything, that he does something boneheaded like this. Let me, let me. I always come back to this. Madigan was speaker of the house. This never would have happened. Now he might have told people like, "Hey, don't talk to that guy." But he wouldn't have put it in a freaking memo or written it down. Well, the Steve Brown was better at his job. Right. The point would have been made clear one way or another. But Welch is doing this because he thinks he's untouchable or Welch's staff or whoever the hell. It is. They think they're untouchable after this primary cycle. They're beholden. They probably are going to pick. They are going to pick up seats in November. So they don't really have to care what anybody says about them because nobody's going to beat them. And Welch right now, he needs to avoid a problem here because he just took out a 38 year incumbent House representative. And I guarantee you a lot of the people in leadership don't really feel comfortable sit talking to the press about, hey, yeah, Welch told me to do that or else I was going to lose my post. They can't say yeah. that. And they don't want to talk to any, they, he can't have them talk to anybody else because you might have someone like Sonia Harper say, yeah, I might be next because that's what every other House Democrat's thinking right now after Flowers lost. So he's trying to make sure that nothing gets out there. He doesn't want anybody to flub and create a bigger problem for himself. But all he did was light the world on fire with, with this memo. So that someone's got to get, again, like I said, with the City War of Elections, somebody's got to get fired here. Will they? Probably not. But this is just egregious. And the only way you stop this is by actually beating Welch in some way, shape, or form. And hopefully the press takes a, uh, a, pay, a page out of this book and says, hey, enough's enough. Screw Chris Welch. We're going to write bad press about him from now until November. You know what? I wanted to mention, I actually walked up on – one of these situations. And I, I saw Jeremy Garner Gorner right outside one of the elevators in the Capitol that day. Uh, question, and I could kind of tell he was questioning a member. I won't mention which member, a Democrat member. And we were all waiting for the You elevator. can tell me offline. Uh, <laughs> doesn't really matter. But anyway, he I could I walked upon this situation where he was questioning a member. I couldn't hear what he asked. His back was to me, but the member was, I could tell being, was uncomfortable and kind of like, Oh, uh, you know, you know, and so 
I didn't know what was going on. Of course, we all got on the elevator together, though, and other people were already on and, and going upstairs. And then once they got off the elevator, I didn't see what happened. So when I read about this later, I'm like, that's what was going on. They were asking uh -huh. Mary Flowers. Um, but you know what else? Just the the curious nature that I have. Some may say nosy. Um, I want to know who who leaked the email. So don't don't you want to know? Because whoever leaked the email, I can't tell you that. One of those people. I can't tell says, you that. I don't like what's going on here with the Mary Flowers situation. So no, I'm not saying to leak it to, to us today, but I, you know, I in the back there, of my head, I'm thinking whoever leaked it to the press then was not happy with the email itself, but also what was going on in that caucus with the Mary Flowers race. There, There is certainly com some consternation, especially in the Black caucus, you know, to see well, leadership take out one of their members like this. And 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 Carol Ammons is probably on the list at some point, right? Because she was Mary Flowers' best legislative buddy. And, and she's been a pain in the ass of leadership. She got removed from leadership. I mean, if if you're someone like that, shouldn't you be shouldn't you be watching your tracks? Yeah, if if you that, that's the lesson here is that Welch can take out whoever he wants. He has the authority to go to the unions and say, hey, you know, Mary Flowers, who's done everything for you over the past 40 years. We don't like her anymore. Start dumping money into Mike Crawford. This is this is a, a, a warning sign, especially to the black caucus. Like there are, I, I guarantee you, there are other black representatives who think Welch is supposed to be their guy in the house because he's one of them who are now looking over their shoulder like, man. You know, I better not buck anything. Uh, screw one vote. Can't vote against anything. Can't make a maneuver against Welch because there might be a hundred. There might be a one point six million dollars of of caucus and labor money going against me because mm -hmm. just because I made one vote and Lord knows personal pack will get up behind it too. They'll get behind it too. They always do. Pat Brady's watching. Pat Brady can't wait to take out people in, in the Democratic caucus too. After, <laughs> but. <laughs> They, they are looking for every excuse necessary to take people out, put new people in there who are just going to get fully behind the Chris Welch agenda. And that's scary if you're a member of the Democratic caucus. Right? You know, Pat Brady's my friend, right? I don't <laughs> care. I don't like the guy. I, this, I think this, this, I mean, we're seeing that, that there's a media problem within the caucuses. Uh, House Republicans, I, I think, are are the best at this, the best to deal with. Uh, typically, if I need something, House Republicans are usually pretty quick to to respond. Um, the the two majority caucuses have have been outright at war with members of of, of the media. The the Senate Republicans are horrible to work with. Uh, the governor's office is horrible to work with. Uh, there are a handful that are good to work with. I would say the comptroller's office is 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 one of the best. Uh, the, the The reality here is that, especially if you're Republicans, and maybe take a page out of the House Republican playbook on the on the state side, is 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 start to, you know, nurture these relationships and get better press because of it, That's instead crazy. of just acting like the media is out to get you all the time. All right. I'll leave it at that. Uh, that one, that was a bugaboo of mine all weekend. And I, I, if, if, uh, if you were listening on the radio in Springfield on, on Monday morning, when I hosted there, I, I yelled about this for, for quite a while. Um, we're, we're getting close to time here. So I just wanted to touch on a couple of other things. Uh, some, some new polling out, uh, shows that, uh, the top issue with voters right now in the state is cost of living. Uh, 49 percent of respondents, not taxes, not any other issue, not crime, not immigration. Um, why do you think that's a, an issue Republicans can win with in in November? Because all you have to do is go to a grocery store and see the cost of toilet paper. You know, in, in the suburbs, especially it's awful up here to, to see that the cost of living is 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 an outrageous impact on people so so what's the what's the political benefit for republicans on cost of living for november well it's, a, would... it's a hot oh i'm sorry um no, go ahead go ahead it's, Robert, just, go. it's because everyone republicans and democrats are paying attention to the cost of living i see that in my legislative office that people are struggling to the things that they used to be able to afford, they can't afford anymore because their incomes aren't rising at the same level that that expenses are. 
And so I think be, it, because of that, because it is a bipartisan issue, that gives Republicans opportunities. It, I guess you'd maybe know more on polling, but but is it something that's going to make someone switch parties and vote for someone for a candidate that says that they're going to tackle that? It's it's a hard topic, obviously, to tackle, but will it make someone who's always voted Democrat vote Republican? I don't know. I don't know if it makes somebody who's always voted Democrat to vote Republican. Those people are already baked in, but you can get people on in the middle and on the margins here. And the biggest advantage that the Republican Party has, and you know, we got to talk about Trump here, Patrick, and we're going to give him props for a second, aren't we? Um, that the Trump administration was the first time in since before Reagan that wages had increased, the median income in America had increased, and people remember the Trump years from an economic perspective very fondly. So the advantage for Repub for Republicans in this state particularly, but even across the country, is that you have a Democrat in the White House, you have a Democrat in the governor's mansion, and all you have to basically say is, you know, it costs, you know, umpteen dollars now to, buy, to, to feed your family more than it used to. You know, and these are these are the Democratic policies they're putting in place. Now, you're going to have a problem because the Democrats are saying, oh, we're appealing to grocery tax, and it's a great idea for some reason. But... The Republicans have advantage of that. One of the few advantages they have of being in the minority in, um, in this state is the Democrats are at the helm here. And the prices keep rising. The prices keep rising. It gets harder and harder to feed, feed a family of four. So they have to yeah. take advantage mm -hmm. of this issue, give proper messaging, and eat around the margins on this cost of living issue. Because it is not a Republican or Democratic issue if somebody can't afford to feed their family. Well, I think that's the question. I mean, is, is, is cost of living... Or or property taxes are these going to be the issues that move those moderate and independent, specifically suburban voters, because that's where you need them. If you're if your House or Senate Republicans this fall, uh, are are those going to move issues with with moderate independent female voters as much as things like abortion or IVF? I think it is because people are are suffering. People. You know, it's the kitchen table issues, those types of things, because they can't hardly pay their bills. Uh, I've got a son uh, who's got a daughter that's driving age, and you wouldn't. He's got a good job. He's he, he's a state police. It, he's a master sergeant with state police, so he has a good job, uh, so to speak. I mean, you know, they're they're getting battered everywhere you look, but as far as making money. But he couldn't find a used car for that kid, you know, for within a budget. You you can't find a used car. He's had to look all the way up. We live in the very southeastern tip of the state. He's looked all the way up into the Metro East. He's crossed the river into Kentucky, into Missouri, just trying to find a used car for, you know, within a, a certain budget for a kid. You can't find them. And if they do get them in, I mean, they're gone within two or three days. You, you can't find a decent car for a kid that's 16 years of age. And just do that wasn't a problem. And if you wanted to try to, to pay cash, you can't do that. They want you to, you know, uh, you mortgage it or whatever you call that. Anyway, if you're trying to pay Finance. cash, it costs you more. So, I mean, you can't even get a car for a kid. I want to so, want to hear people can't even put their kids on the road. I want to hear from Michael here because Michael is a bachelor living in an apartment <laughs> in Southern Illinois. And Lord knows that the, what the Illinois Review says about consultant salaries are nowhere true. So we're, we're making a modest salary here, Butler. How is how's the cost of living in downstate affecting you as a young bachelor making a, a very, very modest <laughs> salary? <laughs> I mean, I think it's hurting all of us. I mean, your money doesn't go nearly as far as it used to. People are feeling that, you know, and you hear it from your friends. I mean, I hear it from my friends, from, you know, my family members that, you know, things are tough and our salaries aren't going up the way that prices are. That's for sure. So I think it's definitely an issue that Republicans can capitalize on and it has more of an impact, I think, than something like property taxes, because obviously not everybody owns a home. And also a lot of people, you know, they pay their property taxes in with their mortgage. They're not actually writing a check, you know, to the treasurer's office. But, mm -hmm. you know, we go to the grocery store every week, you fill up your tank every week, like people that's has a big impact. 
Try feeding a toddler who eats everything. <laughs> the grocery store all the time. Well, uh, all right, we're gonna we're gonna. Yeah. Oh my god, I, I can't uh, can't even wait. Then, uh, we're gonna we're gonna leave it at that. Uh, Representative Alec, I want to give you the last word. What are you working on? Uh, what what can be done in Springfield between now and and mid or end of May that uh, we can make some positive impact on? Sure. Well, we have committee deadline next week in the House. I think the Senate maybe already had theirs. They're off next week. We're we're back next week. Um, we are always trying to make inroads on making Illinois uh, more affordable and a safe place to live and for people to raise their families with good schools and good communities. So anytime we see bills and things that will support that, we usually jump on board or offer them up ourselves and we try to get our ideas out there and, and get bills passed that will help the totality of Illinois. So we'll keep doing that and look forward to seeing y'all in person sometime. Any any indication Republicans want to work or Democrats want to work with you guys at all on the budget this year? Uh, too soon to tell. I would say too soon to tell. All right. We'll leave it at that. Rhonda Belford, president of the Illinois Republican County Chairman's Association, Representative Amy Ellick, Michael Butler, and Chris Jakowiak, uh, who uh, is about to go root on his 60-win team. Uh, hey, so, hey, hey. Uh, I'm thinking we're hitting 70 this year, Patrick. Don't worry. Trust go Cubs, way. go Illini. That's the important stuff, uh, uh, not the White Sox. And, uh, we, Cardinals. Cardinals, yeah. Yes. We look uh, forward to seeing everybody at, at State Convention in Collinsville, May 24th and 25th. All right. Thanks. Thank you all for your, for, for joining us. Thank you all for, for watching and listening. This is the smoke filled room. We'll be back again next week. Let's go Thank white socks. <laughs>